I'd like to take the opportunity, if I could, to welcome everyone to another one of our uh, OE Insights World Tour. These are by, de uh, by design small group sessions, so we're not looking for the webinar style, but more of the small group interactive sessions uh, with experts, leading experts around the world. Today we begin in India, and if I can just go to the next slide here and just share with you a little bit about the background of what we do and why we're doing this. This is so this is a reminder that the event is recorded. Um, during the presentation period, we'd request if you can just have everyone muted uh, and off videos, and you'll see the presenter very shortly. We will uh, request you to go on to video and unmute to ask any questions uh, as we finish up. We anticipate the presentation will be about 25 to 30 minutes or so, uh, and there'll be lots of opportunity for any questions. You can use the chat box if you want to ask a question, or I can certainly uh, raise them for you, or you can raise them yourself. So if we go to the next slide here, please. So this is a series of limited capacity small group sessions, and we've done this in the past, and uh, we will record this and also have transcripts available uh, after this is done uh, for a future uh, resource. Today, again, pleasure to introduce a colleague, a friend, longtime collaborator, Dr. Parag Sanchetti, who is the professor and chairman of the Sanchetti Institute of Orthopedics and Rehabilitation. Many, many more accolades um, that I can present in a very short period of time. But I will tell you um, that uh, this presentation is going to be one which I think will provide uh, more insight uh, than most, simply because you know he does speak to mistakes and the lessons from that we learn from ultimately uh, the challenges we face and how we shape our practices. So I'm really excited uh, to hear uh, Dr. Sanchetti speak and give his insights on this particular topic. Dr. Sanchetti Parag, thank you so much. Uh, we look forward to your presentation. And once again, uh, thank you for participating in the OE World Tour. Uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Mohit, and this is a great uh, pleasure and an honor for me to be here. Please allow me to share my screen and the talk which I'm going to give today is, is very interesting, as you just mentioned. You know, I've just put together a few cases which have really shaped my life, given me lessons and have developed me as an orthopedic surgeon, as a knee specialist. So these are real cases, uh, Mohit, and uh, they have been depicted the way they presented to me and the mistakes I made. On the outset, let me thank Ortho Evidence uh, for this opportunity. Your entire team has been awesome. Ms. Abe has been in touch with me all throughout chasing me for my topic, giving me deadlines, and she's been awesome. And of course, uh, Mohit, you've always been there for us. You know, in spite of uh, your great laurels, you are a person who's so much down to earth. You know, you are a person who has done phenomenal research. And uh, really, this is second to none. You've got great honors, but you're very grounded. And the best thing I like about you is you're a very, very focused person. And I must thank you for having mentored the research at Sanchetti Hospital. You've been visiting Sanchetti Hospital for more than 16 years now. And I still remember the day when you inaugurated our research department and have been coming frequently ever since, at least once a year, if not twice. And these are some memories, Mohit, which will go a long way. So thanks again for really uh, mentoring us, mentoring the research department and, you know, giving us all your expertise, including us in your multi-centric research trials and so on and so forth. And look at this photo. You look so young, Mohit. Uh, and uh, it's really a, a great, great honor to present my work today. As I said, I'm going to talk on the mistakes and lessons, uh, how they have shaped me and my practice. So the basic question is what shapes our life? You know, the various opportunities we get, our family, our career professions, our friends whom we talk to, our passions, adversities, and of course, our mistakes. Now, our mistakes are something which we make, which every human makes, and that is a human nature. But I think what is more important is what we do after the mistake makes all the difference you know to air is human so that is fine but i think we have to learn from those mistakes 
and learn not to repeat them. I think that is what is important. So today is going to be sharing about all my mistakes and the various lessons I learned from them. And these are the various lessons uh, which I have learned. And in the next few examples through cases which I give you, I will try and uh, you know, let you know how I learned and what I learned. Let me take you through the first case. This was a patient who came to my clinic. He, he was a 62 year old male. The resident gave me the history and uh, you know, I was a little bit preoccupied that day. I was a little uh, busy multitasking because there are so many things going on. I quickly examined him, saw his x-rays, didn't talk much to him. And of course the x-rays looked very <clears throat> degenerated knees uh, and I advised him a knee replacement and sent the patient right to my counselor whom we call the care manager to take him through the dates and you know take him through the other logistics for a knee replacement but then my counselor talked to him and the patient said my dear i have definitely some knee pain but i've come essentially for a spine issue i don't have much knee pain but your surgeon has advised me a knee replacement without even listening to me much or talking to me and this is something which really has happened so the patient came right back to my chamber to the clinic and this time i concentrated i talked to him and then referred him to my spine colleague for his spine issue because knee replacement was not what he was looking for so even though i am a knee specialist i have to be a general orthopedic surgeon first you know if the only thing you have is a hammer then everything looks like a nail so every patient coming to you you feel it's going to be a, a knee replacement patient so that's not true you've got to give time you've got to examine the patient you've got to give attention to the patient and i think that's that's very very important sometimes you know we are talking on the mobile giving orders we are talking to the residents or your secretary walks in while seeing a patient and all these things do distract you and believe me the patients don't like it and they really feel offended when you do it so it's not right to use your mobile while you're counseling the patient i think that's something a very big lesson i learned that day the greatest gift you can give anyone is your undivided attention may it be your patient may it be your friend may it be your spouse may it be anybody and i think that is something which one has to learn even though you may be very busy, you may have 100 things on your mind. I think one thing at a time is something what uh, you need to do. And this is what I learned from this patient. Let me take you through uh, my second case. This was a 71 year old patient. You know, so he had severe OA, both the knees virus deformity. We uh, counseled the patient for a knee replacement. The patient underwent a bilateral knee replacement the next day the patient was mobilized everything was going well the patient was walking but then on the third post of day he developed sudden breathlessness hypotension he went into arrest patient had to be shifted immediately to the intensive care was put on a ventilator he had developed a pulmonary embolism you know, that was something which happened and uh, the patient was quite critical you know we were very unnerved and we thought that the patient might not make it it was nine days in the intensive care and that was a tough time for all of us because a hale and hearty patient apart from his knee pain didn't have any uh, uh, major issues but of course his age was uh, more he had actually two comorbidities but then this was really a tough time for the surgeon for the relatives for the icu team the patient was on a ventilator and Every day we were, you know, skeptical on what's going to happen, of course, but we were hoping for the best. Let me tell you on the 10th day, the patient actually recovered. His ventilator became off on the, the sixth day. He slowly recovered. He was weaned off and he was wheeled out of the ICU. So that was definitely a big, big sigh of relief. Just let me take you back, you know, since then I really went into the details. What are the absolute contraindications for a bilateral TKR? and this is what you can see i don't want to uh, really go into the specifics and tell you uh, all the details but it will suffice to say that there are absolute and relative contraindications and what i learned that day that i made rules for myself any patient above the age of 69 years if he has two or more associated comorbidities 
then these are the patients I'm not going to uh, subject to a bilateral knee replacement because the stress on the body is higher and they have increased chances of complications. Even if you see the literature, the morbidity and mortality in bilaterals above the age of 70 is quite high. And this was a huge lesson I learned. Fortunately, we could save the patient. I think patient selection is important, not only for bilateral, for any condition for that matter. You've got to be stringent with your selection criteria. You've got to be very, very uh, selective, you know, what patients you're operating and whether they fit the bill, is it indicated? So in these eight days, friends, it was really dreadful. It was very, very tense moments, very stressful. So what did I do? You know, I do believe in a positive energy. I do believe in the power of prayers. I pray every day and I feel we are all connected. And, you know, there are various ways we can connect to the grace, to the supernatural power. And I do believe in this power of grace. So each one has a different way to connect to that grace. You know, some people might just sit uh, at their homes and meditate. Some may go to a church, to a temple, to a masjid, or people may just go for a walk and just think about that patient or whatever way. But I feel we are all connected. And this is the time where definitely positive energy uh, definitely helps. And this is uh, one spiritual leader in India. The name is Sister Shivani, whom I have been very, very influenced by. And what she says is, your thoughts can change your destiny. Sankalp says Shrushti is a Hindi translation that if you think of something in your mind and if you are dedicated to that thought, you will definitely uh, be able to accomplish that thought, convert that thought into reality and your thoughts can change your destiny. I think that was so apt because all those nine days I was just praying, connecting to the patient and, uh, you know, fortunately things did work. I don't know whether this positive thoughts worked, but definitely I think there is some merit and some power in that. Everybody of us bases our decision on the clinical judgment the scientific knowledge, of course, we do that, but then we do need an element of luck. We also need a good mentor because these are the trying times and you need somebody whom you can talk to, whom you can really share your stress with and these are the mentors who help you. And I have been lucky to have uh, lovely mentors, Professor Anavat, Professor Lard, Professor Holes, uh, my own father, uh, Professor Sincheti. And uh, Mohit has also been a mentor. Whenever I've had any issues, you know, I connect to him and he has definitely some answers, some solution uh, for my problems. So I think it's important that you identify uh, three or four people whom you can connect with, whom you can talk to, and who are there by your side to give you not only advice, but just somebody, you know, who can sh you can share your thoughts with. I think that is important. Let me go to the next case. This was a young patient, a 36-year-old guy who had a fractured upper end tibia. And then uh, the upper end tibia healed. This was uh, operated elsewhere. But this patient developed post-traumatic arthrosis. And he had uh, only 0 to 40 degrees of movement. And after two years of his uh, fixation, he came to me. All he said that was he has no pain, but he wanted more movement. He was able to do everything he told me. He was able to, you know, drive a tractor. That's a... Uh, 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 kind of a, a car you use to do farming in India. That's a very heavy vehicle. He could do that. And he was carrying out uh, everything. But he said, can I get more movement? And I said, of course you can. So we planned a total knee replacement uh, for that patient. So this is the post of x-ray. Everything looked well. He was uh, walking well. But then, unfortunately, you know, he developed an infection at six months. We tried to treat it with antibiotic suppression, deprivement but it just didn't help. And then we were forced to remove the implant and do the first stage of a cement spacer. So that's what we did. After this, we counseled him that either we can do a revision knee replacement or then go for a fusion. The patient didn't have the nerve and the heart to go for another knee replacement. So he opted for a fusion and that's what we did with the nail and the Elizabeth technique and he had a stiff knee, but of course it was painless, but he had no movement. So friends, what's the cost-benefit ratio here? Before the surgery, the patient had no pain, restricted flexion up to 40 degrees, but was able to do everything. But now he has a stiff knee, 
is not able to drive the tractor, the heavy vehicle, he sometimes has pain. And then, of course, in India, uh, everybody is not insured. So they have to uh, pay money from their own savings. So the, this also came at a huge cost. So sometimes, you know, you, you should realize that whenever you're offering a second surgery, you have to tell them that the chances of infection are high and this can be a complication, which probably I did not count in the patient. So when making a decision of major importance, I've always found it advantageous to consider all the pros and cons. And this is what was told by Sigmund Freud. And I think it is important for us that, you know, whenever we subject the patient to a knife, we have to first tell him what are the pros, what are the cons, what are the advantages, what are the disadvantages. Because once you put the knife on the patient, you know, that patient becomes your responsibility for lifetime. You know, even though sometimes you've counseled him, you've told him, uh, the patient always feels that you are obliged to him. You have to take care of the patient, not only in the immediate post-op period, but also if there's some complication which develops, he, he, he holds you responsible morally. So I think that's something which is important. You've got to subject patients to surgery with a lot of thought process. Let me take you through the next case. This was... Uh, a uh, routine uh, knee replacement, elderly lady, everything went well. This was stage four osteoarthritis. The knee replacement was done. But at 12 months, uh, there was a little loosening of the tibial component. Uh, also, the femur was slightly loose. We analyzed it by doing a knee replacement, and I realized that the femoral component was placed in far more internal rotation than what I would have liked. The patient continued to uh, loosen the femoral, the tibial component loosened out and then we went ahead and did a revision uh, knee replacement using a link uh, prosthesis. The patient was fine, but after six months, he came back with a fracture. You can see it at the tip of the prosthesis, the patient developed uh, a fracture. And then we went back and studied uh, uh, post -op, immediate post-op x-rays and then I realized that there was a defect. There was a small you know, rent I had caused at the anterior cortex. There was unilateral crack, which developed into a full-blown fracture. I shared the case with my trauma colleagues, and then this was a periprosthetic fracture. We fixed it with a long plate. Everything seemed all right till nine months later, the patient came back with a broken implant, and we were all disheartened. But then the patient, we counseled the patient, we told her what all had happened and then subjected to her to another surgery. We did a shortening here. We put the processes into the medullary canal of the proximal fragment, did something like a nail plate concept, put another plate. And then fortunately, at the end of six months from the first surgery and after five surgeries, she finally united, consolidated, and now she's walking without any pain. But with uh, some shortening. So what were the issues here? Of course, the patient was dissatisfied. There were multiple surgeries. The costs again were huge. Fortunately, this patient was insured, but then the amount of mental trauma the patient underwent for some of the mistakes, which are hydrogenic. Now that is something which, uh, you know, we have to uh, accept. We have to tell the patient, we have to explain them the complications in proper words. We have to, you know, at this time, be a little apologetic, gain the confidence of the patient and make sure that it doesn't go to another hospital, it doesn't go through go to another colleague because the patient is definitely disheartened and then there can be issues. But this patient fortunately stayed with me. She today visits me. You know, Diwali is coming. This is our national festival like you guys at Christmas. She gets me gifts and I'm still connected with her. I think one should never give up and don't let your patients give up either because you have to keep trying, you've got to keep their morale high. And definitely these patients will be happy patients as long as you can instill that confidence in them and make sure uh, they recover. And ultimately when they recover, then the past is forgotten. Let me take you through uh, one more case. So this was a case, a middle-aged lady. Uh, she had uh, stage two, osteoarthritis there was a chondral defect on the mri and she didn't want a knee replacement because she was not ready for a knee replacement she said you can do anything else but a knee replacement 
And at that is the time I had just come back from Sweden. I had attended a cartilage conference and I had learned a lot on this BMAC and the ACI. We all know what is BMAC, the bone marrow aspirate concentrate. You aspirate the bone marrow from the iliac crest, it is centrifuged, and then it is injected into the chondral defect. So that's what I did. First, did an arthroscopy, did an open uh, bone marrow aspirate concentrate uh, for the patient. And the patient temporarily seemed to be better. The first four months of the patient were quite all right. She was uh, uh, quite happy. But then at the end of six months, the pain came back. At nine months, she was extremely unhappy. And then, you know, the pain was unbearable. And we had to convert this patient to a knee replacement because of failed BMAC. And when I analyzed this case, when I tried to go back and see the mistake which was done, I think this is what we call as the Monday surgeon syndrome. You just come back for a conference Saturday, Sunday, you learned something new and you want to immediately try that out uh, without even going into the evidence, without even understanding what are the merits, demerits, just because you know that speaker has influenced you and you have really uh, been mesmerized by that procedure, you want to try it. And then this is what happens. These are the problems you get. Friends, Many new technologies and advances are being introduced, but anything new, everything new may not be necessarily good. You've got to take each new technology at the face value. You've got to analyze it. You've got to embrace the new technology, definitely. But I always feel don't be the first one to use new technology, but at the same time, also don't be the last one. You know, once the technology is established, proven, you can use it. But friends, let me warn you, technology cannot replace the human touch and that is something which you have to have. Technology can't replace an orthopedic surgeon for sure. But however, orthopedic surgeons who don't use evidence-based proof technology will eventually be replaced by those who do. So friends, I think technology is something you've got to you know, embrace once you are sure and you feel that it is going to help your patient add value to the patient, improve his outcome, then you should use a technology, not because just some guy has marketed to you and then you do it on your patient and the patients are not happy. This is the last case which I, uh, I want to show you. Case six, this was a 72 year old lady with uh, bilateral knee arthritis. Uh, we did uh, the left sided knee replacement I remember this particular patient very vividly. It was the 19th of May. It was actually my birthday. And generally we have a hospital lunch, uh, you know, organized when it's my birthday. Since I'm the chairman of the hospital, so there was a lunch. So everybody was in a slight hurry. So I finished this knee replacement and went uh, uh, to the lunch area where everybody was waiting. You know, post operatively the patient, you know, my resident calls me at about three o'clock. So noon I went there uh that uh, prof the pulse is not palpable you know and uh, did a quick ct angio in the radiology department and there was an injury to the popliteal artery the vascular surgeon was called in and relatives were counseled that this was an issue and then we took the patient back to the or at uh, six o'clock that evening i was sitting there even though it was my birthday i was sitting in the coffee room because i uh, my vascular colleague was doing the surgery. Fortunately, the surgery was successful. post operatively the pulse was palpable and we had managed to salvage the limb. I think the, this is critical that, you know, once there's a complication, you tell the patient that there was a complication, then uh, the patient seems satisfied. If you try to put the complications under the sheet, if you try to cover up by saying something wrong and false, they don't like it. In fact, you should face the complication, tell them upfront, and then they accept it in a better way. So the same patient actually came one year later for the opposite knee, and I did the uh, opposite knee, and she was uh, a happy patient. And fortunately, the second knee had no complications, no vascular injuries, and she still meets me. And uh, you know, we always uh, uh, exchange greetings on festivals, and uh, I'm still in touch with her. What did I learn? What went wrong? Every time, you know, we have checks and processes and before shifting out the patient from the OR, it is mandatory to check the pulse. But that day we did not. And probably it was one of those posterior retractors which uh, got the popliteal artery. And here you can see that also the veins 
the arteries were the, the calcified and probably injured the artery there. And I also put the tourniquet for this case. So I think it's critical that whenever you have these prominent markings, the vascular markings are there, they avoid using the tourniquet because you compress the vessel and increase the chances of vascular damage. To follow the protocols, in this case, we should have checked the pulse immediately, which we did not. Otherwise, we would have probably identified the, the complication in the OR itself and probably done the procedure a couple of hours early, but then that was missed. So I think the processes and protocols and the checklists which are there, you should not skip them or think, be overconfident and say, oh no, I don't need it and uh, the patient will be fine. Ultimately, it's a teamwork. You know, you should have all your vascular colleagues or other colleagues who are there ask for help. And then sometimes even though you're doing a, a difficult surgery and you feel that there is something going wrong, you should not have an ego. You should not hesitate to call a senior colleague or a friend who's there in the next OR or probably somewhere in the hospital to come and uh, give you a hand. Of course, here this was a vascular injury where you probably needed a, a specialist to do it and we call that person. But sometimes it may be some other issues where your colleague can just come and give you a hand. So friends, I think to see a smile on the patient's face is the best gift for a doctor. And in spite of the complications and the mistakes you do, if you can keep your patients happy, I think that's something uh, which is wonderful. And unhappy patients are our greatest teachers because it definitely teaches you a lot and if you give them that extra time, that extra smile and give them, uh, explain to them what went wrong, it doesn't take much to convert these unhappy patients to happy patients. And today, let me tell you, my unhappy patients are my most, you know, the patients in whom everything went well, they are forgotten patients, but the patients who are unhappy, patients who had complications, you always remember them, they are always in their memory and they always remain your good people. Transference is inevitable, sir. Every human being has an impact on another. Why don't we want that in a patient-doctor relationship? A doctor's mission should be not just to prevent death, but also to improve the quality of life. That's why you treat a disease, you win, you lose. You treat a person, I guarantee you, you win. So friends, this is a clip from a movie called Patch Adams, I'll just make you hear it one more time. Transference is inevitable, sir. Every human being has an impact on another. Why don't we want that in a patient-doctor relationship? A doctor's mission should be not just to prevent death, but also to improve the quality of life. That's why you treat a disease, you win, you lose. You treat a person, I guarantee you, you win. So this was the movie, uh, Patch Adams, I would insist all of you see this movie because what he says is right. You treat a disease, you win, you lose. You treat a patient, you treat a person, you be one with him. No, what, no matter what, you know, you will have, you will win and you'll have a good outcome. So friends, patients understand a sincere and a genuine effort. And in spite of that, if there is an issue, there is a complication, they accept it. Even though we've made a mistake and the patient feels that we've given our best to the patient, they will understand us. I think what is important is for the patient to know that how much you care for him, then to tell him that how much you know. I think this is what is very important and we have to go that extra mile and take that extra effort to make him happy. So this is another spiritual leader from Pune, from my city itself. He's no more. He uh, uh, left uh, the earth at the age of 99 and what he always said is patient is a picture of God to serve the patient is to worship God and I truly truly agree and believe in this statement so whenever we make a mistake it is, it is important for us to realize it to reason it to rectify it and never repeat a mistake you know if you repeat it it's not good if you repeat it once if you repeat it twice then I don't think you are fit to be a surgeon you cannot repeat one mistake twice you have to learn from your mistakes and then only you can improve. I'd just like to end by this very, very inspirational quote from Nelson Mandela. I never lose, I either win or learn. And life is all about learning from your mistakes. So I think these are the mistakes which have shaped my career, have given me life lessons, and I'm a better orthopedic surgeon, a better knee surgeon after these mistakes. I really analyzed them, learned from them, 
and have changed my practice, changed the way I think from this mistake. I want to thank all my patients who have not only taught me orthopedic lessons, but also taught me life lessons. And I don't know if rebirth or reincarnation exists, but if it does, I really want to be born again. I want to be born as an orthopedic surgeon and I want to continue to serve my patients. With this, I want to thank you all for your kind attention. Thank you, Team Ortho Evidence. Thanks, Abe, and thanks, Mohit, for this opportunity. Thank you very much.